Welcome to Independent Truth with Scott Atlas, my new show that brings a uniquely rational perspective to important issues facing our society today. Today's guest is Professor Glenn Lowry. Uh, Glenn is an economist and a scholar, a true public intellectual uh, in social sciences. He is, has worked uh, for years on affirmative action, the black family, and as a very un outspoken person for what is sort of an unheard case for black patriotism in the United States. He speaks with a unique voice of experience and with the necessary nuance in these very complex issues. Glenn Lowry and I have a fascinating conversation today about race, equality, cancel culture, and where do we go from here if we want to succeed as a free ethical society. So stay tuned and thanks for joining. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Independent Truths. My special guest today is Glenn Lowry. Uh, Glenn is a professor, uh, the Merton Stoltz Professor of Economics and Social Sciences at Brown University and the Paulson Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He has received many honors, a long list of distinguished awards in his career. He's been elected as a fellow of the American Economics Association. Uh, he's a member of the American Philosophical Society of the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations. He has a uh, very prominent uh, CV with a BA in mathematics from Northwestern and a PhD in economics from MIT. He is an economic theorist and a scholar who has published widely and lectured throughout the world on his research and is viewed as one of the most important voices today uh, in our country, as I think you will see uh, during this podcast. Glenn Lowry's work focuses mainly on race, affirmative action, the race relations in our country, the black family, and something that is rarely stated, the case for what has been called black patriotism. Uh, it's a great honor to have him here as my colleague and my friend. He speaks, as you will see, with a unique voice of experience, with the necessary nuances and thoughtful consideration of these very complicated issues. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Glenn Lowry. Glenn, uh, thank you so much for coming here. Oh, gosh, Scott, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm flattered by it, really. But it's good to be with you. I'm, I'm excited. Great. Excellent. And uh, I think, as everyone knows, you do a, a great podcast, and I'll give some of those details later. Uh, you've been very visible as uh, really, truly what is, what, is, what is legitimately called a public intellectual, and it's a needed voice today. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think that the first thing I want to start talking about is uh, the issue that is really dividing our country to a great extent uh, because, you know, race relations and what's being said and the reaction to it today, uh, I think is very harmful. And I'm extremely concerned about how to move forward as a country without being unified on the most basic levels. It's a very divided country and we need, we need to fix that uh, for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren, uh, if, if, uh, you know, if we want to move forward. So my, my first question, if you can, is, uh, asking about your personal story, given that we're both from Chicago, uh, I can identify with some of it, but I'd love to hear, uh, for the audience too, your personal story as a lead into where you are today. Yeah, well, let me just start by saying I share your concern for the country. I, I, I really do. The summer of 2020, that was not, that was not healthy. That was not good. And it, it, it exposed something, you know, the, the demagoguery, the lying, the avoidance of what the real problems are. Uh, you know, you said black family in my intro. The, 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 the state of social life amongst African Americans that goes undiscussed, the level of violence uh, in some of these communities, um, everything is racism. I, I'm not going to give a sermon here, although I could, because 
the summer of 2020 was a not good thing. Uh, and the intellectuals and, and the, the, the political opportunism of, uh, you know, Jim Crow 2.0, uh, you know, the, waving this bloody shirt of racism, Al Sharpton, these funerals, these public spectacles. Uh, we need grown-ups. These university campuses overrun by this, uh, these, these screeching uh, adolescents. So don't get me started on that. You asked me about my well, personal I'm story. I'm going to get you started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my personal story. So I'm a working class kid. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 1950s and 60s. I got lucky uh, after uh, an early um, uh, sidetrack. You know, uh, my girlfriend gets pregnant. We get married. I'm 18, 19, 20 years old. I got a couple of kids. So, you know, I am drop out of college. Uh, it's a long story. I tell it in my memoir, uh, which will be out next year. But uh, I'm not going to talk about that now. But I mean, I'm, I just came up in the 50s and 60s. It was Black Power. It was Vietnam. Uh, it, it was Malcolm X. It was the Nation of Islam. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it was the 1950s and 60s, a completely different time. I mean, for example, I, was, I felt compelled to marry my girlfriend when she got pregnant. <laughs> not because there was shock. a shotgun. Not because there was a shotgun. And I'm not patting myself on the back. I am not a saint by a long shot, but it was the right thing to do. You know, I mean, I worked in factories. Uh, I knew these white guys, these Polish and Italian and Jewish and Irish uh, who were in the unions and stuff. And, and when they were burning draft cards, I was standing with the guys who were, you know, uh, pro-America. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's 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 amazing to think back because I'm from the same era. Uh even though, you know, there were a lot of problems then and you know, I I nobody thinks there weren't uh, and I think you you talk very eloquently as you will hear about the progress in race relations. So there were real serious problems then. But there was a unifying theme and that was I think uh you know, for lack of a of a of a better word, patriotism. I think we we were Americans, uh, and and I think this uh, I'm very concerned that even that basic point has been has been lost. It, Certainly, uh, where I live in California, I was just going to interject to say that's why this 1619 project and critical race theory thing is so important. It's not just some kind of culture war diversion for quote the real issues quote quote how we tell the story of this country to our children. What could be more central than that? And uh, this. Uh, uh, left-wing thing. I mean, if I were sitting in China wondering how to undermine my chief rival in the most fundamental way, I could do no better than to teach the country that it's morally bankrupt, that its founding father statues need to be taken down, that it's built on plunder, that this great country is built on plunder. Reparations, the, the, the whole mentality uh, it, it weakens us right at our core. And it's not good for black people, frankly, in my humble opinion. I mean, uh, this is a dead end. This, this bought up fist and this kind of separatism thing is a dead end. We have, there's no United Nations tribunal that's going to adjudicate the unresolved issues of race in this country. They're going to be done right here by the people who vote for Donald Trump, the, by the voters of this country, by the heartland of this country. This is where the issue is. The issue is not abstract. The issue is, a, you know, so anyway, right. don't get me and, started. And, <laughs> no, and and you know, I and I and I want to get into this really, because uh, you know, you, you mentioned something there, which is it's not it's 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 harmful to black people. Uh, what's going on? And I want to I want to give a quote, a couple of quotes that you have said in interviews, uh, and and like to hear you expound on that or talk about it. Now, one is interesting, uh, talking about patriotism. There's a quote you said, quote, we're African-Americans, but we are Americans first. We are not African in any way that's meaningful. Yes, our ancestors may have been enslaved, but they were also emancipated, unquote. I mean, I think this, this fundamental uh, knowledge, uh, and it's not just uh, black Americans to me. I always wondered about this hyphenated American thing. Uh, and, you know, I think this is a big change from when we were kids. Immigrants, uh, non non African 
uh, people who came here, you know, they came, my grandparents were immigrants, they came because they wanted to be Americans. Uh, and I see, I see something very different today. It's been building over, over a long time, and it, but particularly it's, it's really, I think, poisonous and frankly, uh, you know, uh, harmful to the national fabric to have groups want to be separatists. Yeah, we, we agree about that. Uh, um, it, blacks were enslaved, but blacks were also emancipated. I mean, this point is underappreciated. Ending slavery and emancipating the enslaved people and having within a finite time their ancestors come to be full citizens of the country is a remarkable historical achievement. It's unprecedented. Was slavery wrong? Obviously, slavery was wrong. And, and in retrospect, slavery was wrong. Clearly. But emancipation was right. <laughs> and and uh, the progress over the century and a half since uh, of the enslaved population having become by now the most powerful and wealthiest large number of African-descended people on the planet. This is historic. So all this has to be judged in context, which is why I say uh, this 1619, uh, let's retell the narration of the country in terms of slavery, is so fundamentally wrong. Well, whatever the uh, accuracy of any particular historical claim, the, the sentiment uh, behind it is, is, uh, is deeply flawed, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, I think this goes down to uh, this idea that of of the whole concept of affirmative action uh and you know we've seen affirmative action you, you and i for decades uh and uh, of course there, there's a rationale for it and and uh, it it may have been great uh in in many ways uh when it was first instituted i don't know but you there's a quote here that you have said uh well, and it's about this idea of the 1619 project, the so-called woke uh, narrative. It's your quote is woke racialism claims the American dream doesn't apply to blacks, which is a patronizing lie that robs us of agency and of authenticity and self-determination and dignity. It doesn't acknowledge that we black Americans possess the ability to rise to meet our challenges and carry the torch of freedom. I mean, this is the to me the 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 poison, the undermining issue here, uh, the harms uh, of of young of young people, right? Uh, you know, rising in the black community, the children. I'd like you to speak to that and what's being said in schools, et cetera. I'm talking about young elementary schools and. Oh well, there's there's a lot of ground there. I mean, affirmative action which is now a half century, you know, that we've been in this business, a special dispensation for blacks in order to overcome the effects of the past. And, I mean, you could make the argument that in 1970, 1980, uh, given the history that you needed to have a state of exception where you, as it were, set aside some basic premises. So, because I think the basic premises of colorblindness and non-discrimination uh, and there's no denying that affirmative action is racial discrimination in favor of the advantaged populations. I think the basic premise of non-discrimination has got to be the, the, the touchstone. Affirmative action deviates from that. And I think historically, retrospectively, you could justify it as a transitional thing. But, I mean, the court's going to hand down a decision, as you know, in the higher education arena on this soon. Uh, we're well, well into a period where we, we got to be worried about what we're doing to our institutions uh, oh, when right. we embed this racial discrimination as a compensatory move where we're changing our standards, uh, embed that uh, as, as an ongoing and, you know, a sort of permanent uh, uh, w way of dealing with this. And I mean, I, I think it, for many reasons, I think it's profoundly corrupting. I, I, I mean, I think merit you're going to put merit on the, on the trading block? Merit. That's the foundation of our civilization. That's not an exaggeration. Absolutely. The achievement of judging by competency as the standard for deploying the discretion to appoint, to hire, to admit, the achievement of that, 
over and against tribalism, nepotism, favoritism is a is a is a cornerstone of of Western civilization. Okay, and particularly the United States, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, which has been a, a refuge for people running from the very opposite of that. So we we can't surrender that. So it's that's just bad for the country. It, it's bad, but for black people, it's especially bad. <laughs> Do you you want to be a ward? You want to be patronized? You want to be patted on the head? You talk about equality and a condition in which you're only present in substantial numbers at places like Harvard because they have a lower standard for you is exactly the opposite of equality. It's frankly racist, I would think. But you, you could know, go again, there. you could go there and say it betrays a fundamental uh, lack of confidence in the capacities of African Americans, and then you decide to, oh, it's okay, you get a pass. You know, so uh, the jig is up. I mean, let, let me just speak plainly. Black people have to sure. man up and woman up. Excuse me. There are no excuses for not performing in America today. There's no excuse not to raise your children, to not know where they are at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, so you're, the fact of victimization does not excuse you from the imperatives of dignified and decent living. These, and when excuse you, me, Scott. Go ahead, Glenn. These murderous thugs in our cities must be condemned by black people, not by white conservatives as exhibiting ways of living inconsistent with the dignity of our people. That would be called leadership. Barack Hussein Obama should be saying that. He's got nothing better to do. The responsibility for this precipice that we stand right on the brink of this country falls to these people, like former President Obama. What's the point? of electing a black man to be president of the United States, if he doesn't step outside of the circle of, uh, um, of consensus and, and lead. So there, I said it. Now, Glenn, I, I, you know, I think we have a, a huge failure of leadership in this country in so many ways. But particularly here, I, I think on race, this is the most destructive leadership void that we could think of, because we are fundamentally destroying the, the fabric of what, of what America is built on. It was built on opportunity. People flock here by the millions every year to come for advancing themselves and their families. Uh, and there's this distinctly different situation here inside. Uh, frankly, okay, from my point of view, of course, I agree with you. Uh, propagated by what we might call the black leadership uh, side of the world. And I, and I wonder why, why is it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my perception is people that speak like you are speaking are rare uh, in the talking head crowd that's on TV uh, that says they speak for blacks and black advancement in the United States. Why is it rare that people address these issues head on like you're doing? I mean, what is the reason for that? Because it seems it seems so obvious to me. I guess they don't want to have the wrong people agreeing with them. So if Donald J. Trump is saying something, you don't want to be a black person heard to be saying the same thing. And I only give uh, former President Trump as an example of the most extreme version of what it is that I'm saying. So if, if a guy, uh, what's his name, Bloom, I think is his name, who's the uh, wealthy advocate behind the anti-affirmative action thing that has uh, the Asian cases in the Supreme Court. Now, I, I'm sorry if I don't get his name correctly. Sure. But in any case, he's been crusading against affirmative action forever. Now, you heard what I had to say about affirmative action, but you're going to be hard-pressed to get any self-respecting progressive to say anything close to what I just said about affirmative action. Believe me, I believe what I said was true about affirmative action. Bad for the country and bad for black people in the long run. They're going to be a hard time saying it because they don't want to agree with the, you know, ideolo so-called ideologues who are, you know, whatever. If Christopher Rufo is against critical race theory, you don't want to be heard as a self-respecting progressive saying something that, you know, Christopher Rufo agrees with, uh, even though 
uh, as I say, I do think this, uh, uh, you know, the American dream doesn't apply to you. Ta-Nehisi Coates, this writer, the Between the World and Me, the book of some popularity 10 years yes. ago or whatever it was, uh, you know, the American dream is a hoax. Don't, don't, don't fall for the hoax. I mean, it, it's all a scheme to keep you down. You know, the cops, every time you step from your door, the cops are going to kid you. This is uh, uh, completely uh, uh, disempowering. You don't have any agency, you know, you know, everybody else in the 21st century is making their way where the streets are paved with gold here in the United States of America. Everybody else is availing themselves of all the opportunities of freedom. And here we are belly aching and telling our children that it doesn't apply to them. <laughs> and so, yeah, <laughs> it seems so destructive. Uh, to people who are basically, you know, kids are relatively speaking a blank slate of looking for moral guidance, for uh, inspiration, for for that's what parents are for. And the the you know, I grew up uh, like you did in the sort of era of the uh, civil rights movement uh, of Martin Luther King, and, and I sort of I'm shocked, frankly, uh, at how that whole idea of Martin Luther King's fundamental point about uh, a society blinded to color is not even spoken about today at all. <laughs> if you were to voice it, you'd be written off as someone who was anti-black. That would be white supremacy and structural racism, uh, which was trying to weaponize King's, <laughs> you know, this is the way they talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, because the, because the colorblind uh, uh, principle uh, leaves the ball in our court. Now, this is what I think is actually going on, Scott. I, I think we're in the 21st century, not the 20th century, that there have been failures uh, to take advantage of opportunities that are created by this revolution of civil rights in the late 20th century, and that now people want to talk about the 19th century. And the 18th century, instead of about the 21st century, because you know, if you do, you you're you're forced to actually man up and and woman up. You know, one of the memories that I have, and and you mentioned President Obama, uh, was during his presidency when he sort of as a as a knee jerk reaction, uh, immediately pounced on a conclusion about a very famous. Uh, you know, crime basically, and, and you know he, I think this is. This Are you is, talking about Trayvon Martin? Yes. Yeah. And you know when we when we see this, okay, I, I'm I'm white, okay, so I'm I'm watching all this, uh, and you know it's what you said to me. The the there is uh, okay, maybe I'm naive here. I don't know, but. I think that nothing's going to change uh, at the, if this discussion is led by whites. And uh, whether you're white and progressive, whether you're white and, you know, marching on the streets for civil rights, I, I think, you know, for, for better or worse, it seems to me, and maybe I'm just way off base here, that this, this discussion, the resolution of this divided uh, country on race is going to be fixed or is going to hinge on black leadership and and what the black community sort of does with this uh, am i wrong in that and uh, i don't know how you feel about what i just said i i think it's interesting i mean i i wouldn't hold my breath uh, about black leadership i i think the problem is very very hard uh i agree probably that if you wanted to really discuss the black family and out of wedlock births and the gender dynamic that goes on amongst African Americans that causes the abortion rate amongst black women to be an order of magnitude higher. Uh, fatherlessness, abandoning, ch abandoned children. And when, I mean, if, if you want to really talk about it, obviously that's the kind of thing that you'd need, you know, to be sensitive to, you know, people's concerns about racism and so on. So uh, I think that's right. Uh, on the, on the Trayvon Martin case, I mean, you know, people, everybody now knows Trayvon Martin was not murdered. He was shot in self-defense. A jury just deliberated. It's been completely investigated. George Zimmerman was exonerated. Mm -hmm. At the time, President Obama didn't know that. He says from the 
White House briefing room. If I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. He goes there. He's the commander in chief and head of the legal establishment of the most powerful country in the history of the world. The fact of his election symbolizes historic turning of the wheel with respect to race in the country. And he goes there. Um, so uh, th 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 that was a lot worse than an opportunity lost. That's where. As you know, the, the Trayvon Martin and the, then uh, the Michael Brown thing in Ferguson, Missouri, gave rise to this circumstance that we inhabit today. Uh, th this was an absolutely critical moment. When riots broke out in Baltimore after Freddie Gray died in the back of a, a police cruiser or a van, and riots broke out, the president had an opportunity, this is President Obama, this is Barack Hussein Obama, had an opportunity to say, get your butts back inside your houses, and if I get your photograph looting or, or uh, throwing a uh, projectile at a police officer, I'm going to see that you get locked up. That's what needed to be said uh, from the Oval Office. Exactly Perfect. the opposite was said. Let's, you have to understand, you have to understand so I, I, I don't, uh, uh, I almost was going to say the word forgive. I don't forgive him for sending uh -huh. Al Sharpton out as ambassador to black America from his administration. I'm sorry. That is mismanaging your portfolio on the most important issue for which it would have made sense to have you elected in the first place. I think I think that is so right. In fact, you know, anecdotally, I think we all know a lot of people uh, who were white who voted for President Obama sure. with the hope that the racial issue would be healed rather than inflamed. I mean, this was actually a goal, I think, of uh, of many, many people who voted for President Obama. Al, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say Al Sharpton again, and I apologize. I'm trying to... Eric Holder. Yes. Goes to Ferguson, Missouri, and creates an injury with this phony, statistically flawed uh, report about policing and racial disparity uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, when <laughs> the, fa the facts of the case, the case at hand, uh, the uh, police officer, uh, whose name I forget right now, uh, shooting Michael Brown under attack was, was the only thing that was really of issue here. I mean, they, you know, they're gaslighting us. They, th you know, they think we're not paying attention. A and I'm sorry to go on like this, Scott, but one of my most cons greatest concerns is that there is a backlash brewing of people, some of whom vote for Donald Trump, who can see just as clearly as you and I can exactly what's going on. Uh, and who will harbor resentment uh, about it. They're pushing this reparations thing as if you can give $5 million ahead to anybody because they're black and not undermine the very capacity to govern your country. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here in the heart of reparations land. Yeah. North of the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I'm shocked at... You know, it sort of rem it reminds me of a lot of things that we've seen over the past few years with the pandemic management, et cetera, a complete denial of the obvious. Uh, and but I am I am shocked that there are actually any honest people who think this is a good thing and makes sense in any way uh, on so many levels. And I wonder. Uh, what what who, who's speaking about reparations? I'm I'm sitting here immersed in the San Francisco Bay Area a, a lot of my time. I wonder how this is playing uh, where you are. You're on the East Coast at a one of the I I I used to think Brown was a very progressive university until I see what Stanford is lately. <laughs> <laughs> Brown is now the sort of uh, center right university compared to Stanford. <laughs> But uh, I wonder how this, this whole reparations topic is playing 
uh, particularly, you know, uh, where you are. And I, I, I want to talk uh, ultimately about the campus environment in general, but with this reparations issue, what is being said about this in on the East Coast, for instance, or where you are? Uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't actually know what people are saying. I mean, I don't hear that much talk about it. It's not an agenda item for action in, in any legislature or anything like that. I mean, on campus, I'd have to assume if you took a poll, it would be 60, 40, or 70, 30 in favor. Uh, among, yeah. amongst the, I'm teaching, actually, my seminar on race right now, and we're this week, week seven, week eight. You know, we're at the reparations part of the syllabus. Uh, they're on break, uh, and I've given them <laughs> some stuff to read. They'll be back. Uh, but, but there's not a whole lot of energy. I mean, it's not as if it's an immediate thing that people are pressing. Okay, this may be a, a Bay Area fetish or something. I think I, fetish I just is don't the know right what... word, actually. <laughs> I think that's exactly <laughs> the right. I mean, because it's symbolic, isn't it? It's 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 yes, some, it it's is. a genuflect. It's a kind of virtue signal, it, it, you know. Uh, and now the whole rhetoric, it's it's all it it's so disempowering. Black people's fate is determined by the fact that my great 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 grandparents didn't get forty acres and a mule. Gosh. I mean, and by the way, the wealth disparity, the economists tout the wealth disparity. Where do they think wealth comes from? Actually, there's a good study by the Boston Fed uh, guy, Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Thompson is his name, uh, of, you know, looking cross-section at uh, variations in wealth and trying to correlate that. And a lot of it comes from Social Security and pensions, invested pensions that you have in your workplace. And it turns out that uh, human capital, education, and occupational achievement and a long t tenure at a good-paying job is the most important determinant of wealth. Duh. I mean, as if wealth falls from the sky or you, it gets handed to you by your parents. So, uh, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything more harmful than overtly pitting people against each other on the basis of race, which is, you know, I, I, I sort of think of it this way too, Glenn. Okay, I, I was raised in a certain socioeconomic environment. I, I was a, a basically a, a lower lower class socially uh, white in the, in Chicago in the suburbs when I was a kid, uh, and uh, we didn't. Now, okay, I, I'm just speaking from my own perspective. But it seems to me we didn't think anywhere near as much about race that in those days as we do today, and I'm saying in a harmful way. I think we have become what I would call a, a, everything is racial now. Everything is determined on the basis of race. It is a truly racist, uh, racially based discussion. Therefore, a racist based uh, sort of perspective is, is everywhere. This is sort of my cynical interpretation of what we're witnessing these days. Especially, on, and I think it's just part of this, uh, what's happening on campus, uh, particularly in these elite universities, quote unquote elite, uh, you know, where you have people, the students there to me are the are the most sheltered, privileged people in the country. Uh, you know, being on these in campus environments, uh, being basically coddled, uh, living a better than most country club, uh, you know, uh, scenes would be. And these people have no, no, very little experience are, 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 are pushing this forward. I wonder how this is going. How, how is the campus, I'd like to talk about speech, free speech on campus, and you're at Brown University, of course. Uh, so two things I have. What is your perspective on what's going on on these campuses? And then I would like to also make sure I talk about or let you say how you are being received, because I think in my perspective, you're such an outlier. And that term, by the way, has been used about me, and I take it as a huge compliment, <laughs> and so I give it as a compliment. Uh, how are you perceived in your world of being a, a, an academician at this sort of uh, progressive university, but also, you know, as a, as a very prominent black intellectual? Oh, okay. A lot could be said here, Scott. I, I think I'm kind of sui generis, you know. I'm, I'm, I, they, they kind of look at me as I'm such an outlier that I'm kind of a thing unto myself, you know, that I'm this <laughs> phenomenon, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'm ignored more than I am uh, anything else. I mean, you know, I could I'm spouting off to the world. I got a podcast. I get you know noticed and everything. And so I'm I'm certainly having my impact. I'm having my moment, as it were. But uh, as for my colleagues, I think they basically kind of stand off and kind of bemused or befuddled or, or infuriated. You know, kind of you know this guy. He's you know. So I'm, I'm this, but in, I'm this in guy. somewhat silence, in silence yeah, rather than one, overt yeah, criticism. Exactly. Now I have students. Uh, you know, I I taught a seminar a couple of years ago for two years running called Free Inquiry in the Modern World, which I developed with with this outstanding young man, David Sachs is his name. He's now a first year law student at Stanford, at, where they don't allow federal judges to give speeches if the federal society has invited the judge. Absolutely not. But we call not it free. allowed we, where the winds of freedom blow. <laughs> we call it, uh, we call the course Free Inquiry in the Modern World. I taught it to 20 eager undergraduates uh, from all, uh, as it were, positions on the political spectrum. I mean, they weren't only or even mainly conservatives. They were 19, 20, 21 year old kids, uh, you know, and we read uh, classics like John Milton and uh, John Stuart Mill and whatnot. Uh, we read contemporary stuff, and we talked about cases. We read uh, Clarence, uh, except from Clarence, Justice Clarence Thomas's uh, biography. You know, my grandfather's hey. son. You know, uh, and and other controversial <laughs> text. Uh, and 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 we got along just fine. And and I I think I'm appreciated as a as a as a plus for the university, but I'm thought thought of as an oddity. But as far as free speech is concerned. Uh, where are the adults in the room? This is my Mitch Daniel, Mitch Daniel, uh, president of Purdue University until he stepped down. I had a convocation yes. on, you know, his transitioning away from being president. But he just represents this exemplar of what I think university leadership should be. And um, I, I think in the same way in which I regret that uh, the former president Obama didn't handle this portfolio on the race questions responsibly, in my humble opinion. I think, too, that leaders of these great uh, educational institutions are mismanaging their portfolio when they don't, when they, you know, let the inmates run the asylum would be one of the metaphors, you know, when, when they don't stand up for the, the deep uh, values on which the uh, whole enterprise is, is premised. Uh, so we're not here to show that we're on the right side of history at the university. We're here to be able to think critically and usefully about what exactly the right side of history might be. We got to teach people how to argue, how to assess evidence and facts, how to deal with ambiguity and with difficult, you know, we, we, we got to teach them to revere the traditions of inquiry, that, that we're the custodians of an inheritance of enormous value. <laughs> So when, when they put all that on the altar of uh, equity, when, when they allow transitory uh, sentiments and, and, and uh, uh, you know, impulses uh, to, to guide the way in which they oversee the traditions that allow us the benefits of modern life, uh, they, they don't handle their responsibilities very well. So, I, you know, career concerns. I mean, I, I could argue with my provost, but my provost wants to be president one day, if not of this institution or some other institution. The last thing okay. he wants is a bunch of kids sitting in his office saying that he's transphobic. Absolutely. So he's Just not going to hear me. He's not going to hear what I'm saying. You know, I, yeah. So these, this, you know, they say, they say uh, that the company uh, CEOs play to the short-term stock returns. University administrators are playing to the short-term, what's going to be my next job? How am I going to finish my career concern? And they're betraying us. I, I completely agree. And in so many ways, we have entrusted our children to these people. And by doing so, we have entrusted the future of our country to these people to a great extent. And uh, I agree, again, there is nothing more important than teaching the young generation how to think critically. Uh, that is the role of a university. That is perhaps the most important role uh, it's not to learn facts out of a book. You could do that online. You could do that by reading on your own. It's simply to 
understand engaging ideas that differ, that you have to judge and think through. Uh, and that, that's a very, very, uh, that's an essential task to be able to function as an individual, let alone lead. Uh, we have a massive void in, in leadership. And in, in what I mean by that is uh, what I call ethical leadership in this country. I think we have a tremendous absence of courage. Uh, it is true, the cancel culture that we have all experienced on campus and elsewhere is powerful. Uh, you, you need, but we need people to step up. As I like to say, rise up, which means speak up. Uh, that's what you're not just allowed to do in a free society, in a democracy. You're, you're expected to do that. You must do that or the freedoms disappear. Well said. Well, uh, you know, uh, let's finish up, Glenn, in a few minutes with sort of where do we go from here? Uh, you know, uh, you're going to continue to speak up. That I am confident about. Uh, and uh, we need more people, and you're, you're very inspirational. And as you mentioned, your, your uh, autobiography is coming out in, in next spring, and so we're all going to be watching for that because I think personal stories are very important to understand what people are saying as well as to inspire others, I think, and, and that I am very anxiously awaiting your book. Thank you. But where, where do we go in the, in the, in, you know, right now uh, in this country? Uh, there is not a, a, a lessening of the divisiveness that we're seeing, in my view, at all. I don't see any, any I, I personally don't see a positive sort of evolution of this. Maybe I'm wrong. What, what do you think and where do we, how do we, how do we go proceed? I don't know. It's hard to be, it's hard to be optimistic. First, do no harm is kind of almost what I want to say. I mean, let's stop doing the, stop doing the stuff that's, that's absolutely harmful. Uh, d defend merit. I mean, I, I not, don't be embarrassed to stand up for values. I mean, if, you know, uh, but in a way, I'm really only reciting my own catechism. That's the reason why I'm, you know, playing the role and doing the things that I'm doing, because I've just determined at this stage in my life that that's what I want to do. Uh, return to the roots, spiritual awakening. <laughs> Seriously, I, I'm, I'm actually yeah. serious about that. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think this is something that we, we don't talk about enough, really. Uh, yes, we're, we're sort of a, uh, we have evolved certainly into a very secular society. Yeah. I think people that are, have a faith basis for their lives have either been pushed into silence or are, are certainly less visible. I was raised in a very secular home, uh, but, uh, you know, somehow, uh, we, we understand moral and ethical principles, even without religion. But I think religion is really key, I think, to a functioning, virtuous society. And, and I think a lot of that has been lost. I, I, I wonder uh, how to restore that. I don't know. Of course, we don't have the answers, uh, but we need to keep speaking about that uh, because that is the foundation uh, of, our, of our country and I think that's actually an untapped unifying theme between races. Yeah, but, you know, realistically, you wonder uh, if there's any pathway that actually gets you there. Uh, so, I, you yeah. know, but, but I, yeah, yes. It's, it's a difficult issue, of course. Right. Well, Glenn, I, I really uh, thank you for your time. I think, uh, you know, this is sort of, quick podcast doesn't do justice to any of these topics, but we're all inspired by your courage. I want to say that right out front because, uh, you know, having had death threats and all kinds of stuff myself, I, I, my guess is it's, uh, it's an order of magnitude higher for you, all of these things. Uh, but we, we, we are thankful that people like you find it, that, uh, it's just too important to, to, to ignore these issues are fundamental, and uh, if we don't speak out on these things, who will? So uh, thanks again, Glenn. Really appreciate it. Hope to have you back. I look forward to coming back, Scott. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas today. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Professor Glenn Lowry, check out his Substack, his Twitter, and his own podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else 
where you're listening to podcasts right now. I'll see you next time.